ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Mr. Saucedo's YouTube videos. Today we're going to be going over the second part of Chapter 6 in Zumdahl, the 7th edition, which is all about thermochemistry. So last time we only got through the first section because there were so many definitions and there was so much stuff going on in the first section, but the last two sections in, uh, that we're going to be covering, section 6.2 and 6.3, are definitely a little bit more easy to digest because now we know a lot of definitions. So uh, the first thing we're going to talk about is change in enthalpy. So remember that last time we referred to the law of conservation of energy, and we told you what energy is, and we told you what heat and what work are, okay? And you probably don't remember this, but we said that heat... Um, is an example of something that is not a state function, okay? Which means that um, a state function, remember, is something that only depends on the final state and then the initial state. It doesn't matter the pathway you take in order to get there. So the thing about enthalpy is enthalpy is a state function, and it is abbreviated as capital letter H. Now, the nice thing about enthalpy is that it is equal to, so the change in enthalpy is equal to heat at constant pressure, which is basically any kind of situation that you would really ever see in this class and also in reality, okay? Um, because if you're changing the pressure now, technically it's no longer going to be equal to heat anymore. There's also work and other stuff that's being done. So again, the nice thing is that we made this big deal out of like state functions and said that heat is not a state function. Well, guess what? Heat is kind of acting like a state function at constant pressure and what we do is we call that enthalpy. So what is the change in enthalpy? Well, because it's a state function, it's equal to the enthalpy of whatever you made, so the products, minus the enthalpy of the reactants. And it's a very useful quantity for us to be able to discuss and find. So another thing is that enthalpy is usually measured in kilojoules. So um, in the back of your book, generally speaking, you'll find a table of thermodynamic values. And so enthalpy is almost always going to be found there. It's definitely found in your book, and it's measured in kilojoules per mole. Okay, and so notice that even though enthalpy is measured in kilojoules, the thermodynamic values are measured in kilojoules per mole because it does depend not just on, you know, again, um, the final versus the initial, but also how much of it you have. So it's it's always good to know that we're talking about one mole of each of these things. And so um, what you'll find in your thermodynamic table, though, is it's called standard enthalpy of formation values, okay? And so you'll see it's delta H sub F standing for formation. And the little circle that you see, that degree symbol, means that it's standard, okay? That's technically what that's a reference to. So how would we actually use this practically? So let's say I am burning propane in the presence of oxygen to make carbon dioxide and water. And let's say that I know the enthalpy change is equal to, for this reaction, negative 2221 kilojoules per mole. So 2,221 kilojoules per mole. Let's assume, like it says, all of the heat is coming from the combustion of the propane. There's no external source of heat. So how much enthalpy will we get out of five grams of propane if we're burning it? And again, it does give us more information. It says that we have excess oxygen. So oxygen doesn't matter in this equation. All we care about is how much propane we started with. So if I'm even just looking at my units, I can say, okay, well, five grams, I have got kilojoules per mole. These are not going to cancel at all if I even attempt to put them together. So what though would happen if, suppose, I take my five grams and I convert that to moles? So let's do that. So I've got five grams of propane. The molar mass of propane is 44.094 grams per mole. And so my grams are gonna cancel and now I have moles of propane. Remember that this value here, the change in enthalpy, is equal to negative 2,221 kilojoules per mole. So all I have to do is multiply negative 2,221, uh, sorry, 2,221 kilojoules per mole. And now notice that all of my units are canceling except for kilojoules, and I'm left with negative 252 kilojoules, which would be, again, uh, the enthalpy of uh, five grams of propane burning in excess oxygen. So it's just as simple as this, converting from grams to moles, multiplying by the change in enthalpy, and then you'll get your response. Now, what if I had one mole of this stuff? Well, I think that becomes pretty obvious, right? What if I had one mole of propane? 
well, then it would be exactly equal to this. So if I have less than a mole, the enthalpy change is going to be less than the value that you look up in the book. If, on the other hand, I have more than a mole of what I'm looking at, then it should be more than the value that's in the book, because this is literally kilojoules per mole. So for one mole of this stuff, this is what we would get. All right, now let's talk about calorimetry. So calorimetry is the science of measuring heat. The word calorie is in here, and calor means heat, uh, meter meaning to measure, right? So two definitions. Really, the first one's the only one that really matters in our situation, but I'm going to give you both um, that deals with calorimetry. So the specific heat capacity. So that's abbreviated many different ways. Uh, the way I've always seen it is capital C. Um, in some books, you'll see lowercase s. It just depends on the book. Um, but specific heat capacity is the energy that is required to raise the temperature of one gram of a substance by one degree Celsius. So in other words, how much energy is it going to take for me to heat up if I have one gram of any substance, one gram of aluminum, one gram of copper, one gram of water, uh, and to change the temperature of it by one degree. How much energy does that take? Now, another constant is molar heat capacity, and that's the energy required to raise the temperature of, you guessed it, one mole of a substance. So if I had one mole of water, or one mole of aluminum, or one mole of iron, how much energy would it take to raise it by one degree Celsius? So specific heat capacity is more useful, but molar heat capacity, if you're dealing you know, with moles of a substance, might be something that also would be useful to you. So here's something that's important about calorimetry. Remember, the direction of heat flow is very important, and that's from 6.1 when we talked about the direction of heat flow. So if you have two reactants and they are at the same temperature and you mix them together, so say we have two um, solutions at room temperature, and I add them to each other, and all of a sudden I measure a temperature change and the uh, solution is getting warmer, that means that the overall reaction is exothermic, that it is releasing heat to the surroundings, and that as a result of that I'm seeing a temperature change in my thermometer that is positive. On the other hand, if you mix two room temperature things together and instead they lose are losing energy, quote unquote, or are losing heat, that means that it's going to get cooler and the solution is endothermic. So it's literally absorbing heat from the thermometer. It's absorbing heat from the surroundings. And so as a result, the surroundings are getting cooler and cooler and cooler. Okay, um, so calorimetry is a great exercise though in some lab techniques. So the most common one is a coffee cup calorimeter. And that's made of two styrofoam cups. And so a coffee cup calorimeter looks something like this. So you have one styrofoam cup, and then you have another styrofoam cup that is inside of the, the previous one. And so what you do is you put a little lid on it, and that can be made out of almost anything. Cardboard's usually what I use, because you probably have something that's cardboard in your house that's nearby. And then what you do is you make a little hole and you put your thermometer through it. And then this is going above and beyond because you normally want to stir it. So you could just kind of like shake it a little bit and kind of like move it side to side. But if you wanted to, you could put like a piece of copper wire or something else through here that you're able to just kind of twist in a circle in order to stir the solution. So what you do in a coffee cup calorimeter is you have your reaction taking place in here, and then you're measuring the temperature change as the reaction goes on with the thermometer itself. So what you kind of do is you say, okay, great, I'm gonna measure my initial temperature of my solutions. So you would just put one of the solutions in here and measure the temperature, and then have the other solution off to the side, measure the temperature of that one too. Make sure they're you know at the same temperature to start with, the room temperature kind of thing, right? And then you quickly pour in the other solution, close it up, put the thermometer in, and start stirring. And what you should see, if it's exothermic, is the thermometer will be getting warmer and warmer and warmer as it absorbs heat from the reaction. Um, and then on the other hand, you'll see the temperature decrease if instead, like I said, it is uh, the solution is absorbing heat from the surroundings. So the thermometer will be getting cooler as a result of that. So calorimetry. What exactly is calorimetry? Well, the the nice thing is there's an equation for calorimetry, um, and it is how you can figure out how much heat a reaction has. So the energy released by heat is Q, or abbreviated as Q in most textbooks, and that's going to be equal to C times M times delta T. So remember, C is one of our 
uh, constants that we just talked about. It's the specific heat capacity. Now, I didn't tell you what the unit is for specific heat capacity, but generally speaking, specific heat capacity is joules per degree Celsius times grams. So the grams part is because, again, we have to know the mass, the starting mass. So right here, the mass of your solution. Um, again, joules is going to be our measurement of heat in that situation. And then uh, degrees Celsius is because that's going to be our temperature that we're going to be measuring this in, not in Fahrenheit or anything else. So delta T is the change in temperature. And that's, like I said, in degrees Celsius. Um, the big important thing is the mass that you're measuring here, the M, is the mass of the solution. So those liquids that you're putting in. Um, because a lot of times people end up getting um, a little confused, let's say, by um, what the M is really talking about. Um, so M is the mass of the solution inside of your little coffee cups that you are now measuring the heat of. And something that I thought was really um, obvious, but some people get a little confused, is what is the change in temperature? So the change in temperature is going to be equal to the temperature of the final solution, so you know when you're done with your calorimetry, uh, versus the uh, initial temperature that you measured at the very beginning of your experiment. And generally speaking, when we say final temperature, we don't mean like after an infinite amount of time has elapsed. What we're talking about is the either hottest temperature that was achieved, if it's exothermic, if it's an exothermic reaction you're looking at. So because of inevitably what's going to happen is the thermometer is going to peak at some point, and then the reaction is going to start to cool off and slow down and it's going to start to decrease. So you want to keep a careful eye on your thermometer so that you can see the highest temperature that that reaches. And then if it's endothermic, it's the opposite. So you're going to want to reach the, you're going to want to find the lowest temperature that it reached because eventually once the reaction's done, okay, it's going to start to warm up again. And so it's very important that when you're looking at your calorimetry, that you're identifying the final temperature as in the, the highest or lowest temperature that was achieved in your reaction. So here's a good example. We're going to do like three of them because they're pretty good questions. A 100.0 gram sample of water at 90 degrees is added to a 100 gram sample of water at 10 degrees. The final temperature of the water is what? Okay, so here's the nice thing about heat. Okay, like we said, it's the law of conservation of energy. And since it's the law of conservation of energy, that means that whatever is happening with one sample of water is going to be exactly equal to whatever is happening to the other sample of water when you mix them together. So the heat is either being absorbed or it's being released, but that's going to be equal. They're going to be able to be set equal to one another. Now, remember, um, the heat flow that we're looking at here, if something is losing heat and getting cooler, okay, so if something's losing heat versus gaining heat, um, you're going to have a different sign associated with that um, temperature change, let's say, or with that heat, let's say. So on this side of the equation, I have the water that is at 90 degrees, okay? And notice it has a negative sign in front of it. The reason why is because this sample is going to be releasing heat. It is the warmer of the two. Whereas the sample of water that's at 10 degrees, it's going to be absorbing heat. So that is a positive change, a positive value. So I didn't have to like put a little sign or something in front. Okay. Now the 100 grams is the same for both samples. So we put 100.0 and we put 100.0. That is going to be like our, our mass here of that uh, solution. Okay, now what is 4.18 joules per gram degree Celsius? That is going to be the heat capacity of water. So the specific heat capacity of water is in your book, and it's on that table. It's 4.18, and since we're talking about mixing water with water, they are the same exact value. Now, 90 degrees, 10 degrees. Okay, so my initial starting temperature is 90 degrees for this sample. For this one, it is 10 degrees. So that means that my final temperature, I don't know what that would be. My final temperature is a mystery in both situations. And so when I subtract my you know, 90 or I subtract my 10, I'm going to be having to solve for TF by the time I'm done with this. All right, so let's go through and solve this. So I've got my negative 100 
uh, I've got 4.18, so I would multiply that through to get negative 418. I would do the same thing here. 100 times 4.18 is going to give me 418, and so I would just kind of keep that consistent. So now I've got this side a little simplified and that side a little simplified. Now I'm going to want to multiply through my negative 418 by my final temperature here, my x, and then multiply negative 418 by 90, or negative 90, I guess I should say. And then same thing here, 418 times this, 418 times negative 10, or minus 10. And so this is what I would get as a result of that. And so now notice I need to get my... Um, my unknowns, my x's on the same side. So I could subtract 418 here and then uh, subtract, you know, the 418 from this and add those together. Now I'm going to have to subtract uh, 37,620 from negative 400, or sorry, negative 4,180. When I do that, I get this. Now if I divide by negative 836, I now have my final temperature all by itself. And so all I got to do in my calculator is negative uh, 41,800 divided by negative 836, and I get about 50 degrees. Again, I didn't keep track of all of my units as I was doing this. I thought that would look a little bit more confusing if I did. But why are we having... Uh, 50 degrees, let's say. Um, I actually don't think that this translated very well. These should be 90 decimal and 10 decimal degrees Celsius. So that means that I should have two significant figures in my answer, and so that's where that came from. But it looks like maybe the little decimal points either got deleted or accidentally were moved around. All right, see, so here's um, the second example. So now we have a 100 gram sample of water at 90 degrees, just like before. Now we have a 500 gram sample of water at 10 degrees. Let's calculate the final temperature, but before we do that, make a prediction. So in the last situation, it was 50 degrees Celsius. What do you think the temperature is going to be this time? All right, I'm not gonna run straight through it, but uh, again, same setup. This is going to be losing heat, so it's negative. This is going to be gaining heat, and so it is positive still, okay? So let's multiply through, and then let's simplify, and then let's simplify even further, and so we end up with something that looks like this. And so you can see when I divide my negative 2,508 by this number here, it's going to be a lot smaller of a value. And so we get about 23 degrees Celsius. Just like before, you can see that um, it's supposed to be the decimal point here is uh, representative of only two significant figures. So I only have two significant figures in my answer. Okay. Let's do another one this time, though, where we've got um, a different metal, let's say. Um, we're not looking at just water, we're looking at iron. So 50 grams of water at 10 degrees Celsius, 50 grams of iron at 90 degrees Celsius. So remember, the specific heat of water is 4.18, but we'd have to look up in a table what's the specific heat of iron. So the specific heat of iron ends up being 0.45 um, which is pretty low. So notice that um, most metals have pretty low numbers for specific heat, whereas water actually has a really high specific heat. Um, more on that later on when we talk about intermolecular forces and hydrogen bonding, but um, what's the final temperature in this situation going to be? All right, so what do you think is going to happen? Um, again, we're going to set it up the exact same way. So which one of these is warmer? It's the iron ball. So the iron ball is going to be losing heat. And so that means it is the exothermic part. It's the negative one. Whereas the water is going to be gaining heat because it's at a cooler temperature. And so what we're going to do is once again, multiply through and simplify. So let's multiply through. Let's simplify down a little bit. Let's simplify down even further. And now what would the temperature of the water be? 18 degrees. So even though the iron ball was extremely warm, its specific heat is pretty low. So when it's transferring its heat, it's not as good at transferring heat um, to the water um, as the water was transferring heat to itself, believe it or not, in the first example. All right, now let's talk about the last section. Section 6.3 is Hess's Law. Hess's Law is a great um, visualization of what goes on when we're looking at enthalpy changes. So keep in mind, right, that if I am going from a particular set of reactants to a particular set of products, the change in enthalpy is the same, 
whether I do that in one step or I do it in a thousand steps. Because enthalpy is a state function, so in reality, it doesn't matter whether I'm looking at something simply um, as something like this. Let's say that you know I could do this in one step, the enthalpy of formation in this situation. You don't have to know the details of this. Or I could do it in one, two, three, four, five, six steps. But the result is the same. Because remember, it's a state function. So I can take my initial state and I can take my final state and I can subtract the final state from the initial state and I get, you know, my enthalpy. So um, that's kind of why state functions are useful. Because again, I could have easily done this in just a straight step from here to here and found my enthalpy. Or I could have done it this way, which is a lot more complicated, but also kind of cool. Um, I could have done six steps by, you know, looking at all the heat being absorbed and then heat being released. And then the net change is still just the final state minus the initial state. So what is Hess's law? Hess's law is a way of being able to combine together um, information about different reactions and their enthalpies and be able to make a um, kind of final uh, enthalpy of an overall reaction. So for example, I have got my nitrogen gas, I've got oxygen gas, and I'm mixing them together, and I'm making nitrogen dioxide. That enthalpy of um, that enthalpy that I'm looking at for the enthalpy change of this reaction is 68 kilojoules. But I could very easily have done this in two steps. So I could have done, you know, nitrogen gas plus oxygen gas makes nitrogen monoxide first. Then I mix nitrogen monoxide and oxygen together, and I make nitrogen dioxide. And so notice that these have different enthalpies, though, right? This enthalpy is 68, this enthalpy is 180, and this enthalpy is negative 112. But what do you notice about these? Well, if I'm going to be honest, look, if I'm looking at the left side of this reaction and the right side of this reaction, the nitrogen monoxide doesn't really matter because it appears on the left and the right and they're both the same amount of them. So I could very easily cross them out. And then notice that I still have one nitrogen molecule. Now look, I have two oxygen molecules. Look, I have two oxygen molecules in this one. Here I have two nitrogen dioxides. Here I have two nitrogen dioxides. So what if I add these enthalpies together? So 180 minus 112 kilojoules, I get, you guessed it, 68 kilojoules, which is the exact same. So it doesn't matter whether I did this in one step or I do it in two steps, the resulting enthalpy change is exactly the same in both situations. This is Hess's law. And so what Hess's law says is that regardless of how many steps there are, all I need to do is look at the enthalpy change of, you know, the total. And when I do that, I can get the enthalpy change for my reaction. So again, principles behind Hess's law. So again, it would take 180 to go from here to here. Uh, I would get negative 112 to go from here to here. And so the overall change is the difference between the two, which is just this, this little bit. Or, very easily, I could have just done it in one step, and automatically the enthalpy change is literally just that little part. All right, so what are the characteristics of these enthalpy changes? The first thing you need to realize is that if a reaction is reversed, so what if we switch the sides the products and the reactants are on? What you do is you change the sign of the change in enthalpy from positive to negative or from negative to positive. The magnitude of delta H is directly proportional to the quantities of reactants and products. Like literally in the very first example we did in this, um, remember if you had five grams of propane, that would be different than if you had 10 grams of propane or 15 grams of propane. So it's directly um, proportional, let's say, to the number of moles of each one you have. So if the coefficients in a balanced equation are multiplied, let's say, you know, okay, I want to double everything in my reaction. I could multiply everything by two. But if I multiply everything by two in my reaction, I also have to multiply the delta H by the equivalent integer. So I'd have to multiply my delta H by two because now I'd be doubling the amount of reactants and products. So here is an interesting situation. 
So here I have, oh, by the way, I guess I should have also said this. Um, a lot of times in Hess's law, you'll actually see balanced equations that are written with fractions um, for their balanced equations. Now, generally speaking, um, I'll just speak for most chemistry teachers out there. They probably will tell you, okay, we don't like this very much, like half a nitrogen, you know, three, uh, three halves of a hydrogen molecule. What does that really mean? But for Hess's law, it's fantastic. It's great because um, it makes actually the math sometimes a lot more easier. So it just depends. Okay. Or I guess I should say a lot easier, not more easier. That's not really, that's not really good English. So um, anyway, ammonia uh, is generating half a nitrogen and three halves of a hydrogen. And this is our energy change. This is our enthalpy change, I guess I should say. Um, here I have two hydrogens. I've got plus an oxygen molecule and I'm getting two waters and this is negative 484 kilojoules. Now I'm saying I want to calculate the actual enthalpy change for a reaction like this. So what if I have two nitrogens plus six water molecules and I get three oxygens and four ammonias, okay? So how can I manipulate these equations in order to get this? All right. So problem solving strategy, first thing, I always say work backwards, okay? So what you're gonna wanna do is look at where your products and where your reactants are in the equation that you're looking for, and then figure out, okay, great, how can I manipulate my equations in order to do that? Next, like it says, reverse any reactions as needed to give the required reactants and products. Remember, when you reverse a reaction though, you have to change the sign on the enthalpy change for that reaction. And then finally, multiply the reactions to give the correct numbers of reactants and products. So we're going to start by working backwards and reversing reactions. So first thing, this is what I wanted, right? If you go back to the previous slide, and even the one before that, you'll see that the nitrogen and the water and the oxygen and the ammonia are on opposite sides. So what I could very easily do is now move my half of a nitrogen and I could move my three halves of a hydrogen to this side of the reaction. So now they're the reactants, not the products. And now I can move my ammonia from the reactant side down to the product side. But that was 46 kilojoules, but now I've reversed my reaction. So now I've got negative 46. But now look, my nitrogen's on the right side. My ammonia is on the right side. Same thing here. I could very easily do the exact same thing. So I, what I did was I reversed the reaction. Now water is a reactant, where before on the previous slide it was a product. So by doing that, now my water's on the right side. Good to good, good, good to know, right? And my oxygen is on the right side of the reaction now also. All I had to do was change the sign to show that I moved them from the reactant side to the product side and vice versa. So now I have this. Okay, so that's kind of step one and two. Step three, I want these reactants and products to have these numbers though. And so here I only have, look, I have two, I want six. Here I have three, but I, you know, I want three, but I only have one. So what if I multiply this all by three? If I multiply this all by three on the bottom, now look what happens, right? So by multiplying this through by three, now I have six waters and I have three oxygens. But remember, I would have to multiply the enthalpy change also by three, so I have triple this amount. Here, I want two nitrogens, but I have a half. So if I multiply everything by four, now I have two nitrogens. Multiplying this, you know, by four, now I have four ammonia. And you might think, well, what about those pesky little hydrogens? Well, what happens to the hydrogens? Four times two, or sorry, four times three divided by two, you know, um, gives me um, how many hydrogens? Three. Here, I have three, or sorry, uh, gives me six. I can't do math. Here, I have three times two, that's six. So really, the hydrogens on this reactant side and the hydrogens on this product side do not actually matter in the reaction. I can just cross them out. And so now, my final reaction here, look, again, my hydrogens are disappearing. I've multiplied these through by their coefficients. And now I can just add everything together and I get positive 1,268 kilojoules. But I used Hess's law to do so, because look at the overall reaction, two nitrogens, two nitrogens, six uh, waters, six waters, four ammonia, four ammonia, three oxygen, three oxygen. And that's how you use Hess's law in order to solve pretty much any equation. All right, so the last section we're gonna be going over is 6.4, 
standard enthalpy of formation. So I told you what a standard enthalpy of formation was, or at the very least, I told you that it exists in the appendix in the back of your book. So the standard enthalpy of formation of something is the change in enthalpy that accompanies the formation of one mole of a compound from its elements with the substances in their standard states. So in other words, how much enthalpy does it take in order to form one mole of whatever we're looking at from the elements that make it up? Okay, so like it says, can be found in the back of your book, nice and simple. But here are some conventional definitions for standard states. Okay, so for the four compound, if it's a gas, we're assuming the pressure is exactly one atmosphere. So we're at standard pressure. Remember that uh, enthalpy is only equal to heat at constant pressure. So that's important. For a solution, so if we have some, um, you know, some little ions floating around in solution, the concentration of what we're looking at is going to be exactly one mole per liter. Pure substances, we're talking about liquids or solids. Again, totally fine. We're, we're talking, when we say L or S, they are pure, they're not mixed with anything else. Now, for an element, when we're talking about the elements individually, okay, when we're talking about like a nitrogen gas or we're talking about a potassium metal, we always take the form of whatever that element is at one atmosphere and 25 degrees Celsius. So we're at basically, let's say, room temperature, and we're at, again, a constant pressure of one atmosphere. So we're not talking about, you know, liquid nitrogen when we're doing standard enthalpy of formation. We're talking about, you know, just, you know, nitrogen that's in the air as a gas. Now, a, a nice little convention here for standard enthalpy of formations, uh, something that I didn't actually put on the slide, the standard enthalpy of formation for any pure element like nitrogen gas or for, uh, in this case, a potassium metal is always going to be equal to zero. And that is like a nice little, um, let's say, uh, accounting technique for uh, having a baseline reading for something. So compounds are all going to have something above zero for enthalpy, but pure elements are always going to have a defined enthalpy of formation of zero. So here's a schematic of the diagram of the energy change for this reaction. So I've got my uh, methane and I've got my oxygen and I'm making carbon dioxide and I'm making uh, water molecules. So for um, for the enthalpy change for um, methane, it's negative 75. For oxygen, when you look it up, it's zero. Why? Oxygen is already in its elemental form, and so it doesn't matter. It's just zero by definition. Uh, carbon dioxide is negative uh, 394. And then water is negative 572. So when I add them all together, I get an overall change of negative 891. Now you might think to yourself, why is this negative negative? So here's technically how we find, remember, the standard enthalpy of formation, or I guess I should say the standard enthalpy change for this reaction. It's always the final minus the initial. So because um, I wanted to show you them in the order that they appear in the reaction, um, I decided to instead just kind of put a negative sign in front of this one so that you could see that we're actually subtracting it. That's what we're doing is we're taking these values here and we're subtracting these values for water. Uh, sorry, for oxygen, it doesn't matter because it's zero. But for this one, it does matter because there's already a negative sign here. So we have to subtract this side from this side and you get negative 891 kilojoules. Now in picture form, what's going on? So I want to know how much energy does it take to kind of form uh, methane and break it apart into one carbon and into its hydrogens, okay? And so that, again, takes a certain amount of energy. For oxygen, it doesn't matter because, again, it is a standard enthalpy of formation rule that any pure element is going to be just equal to zero there, okay? But to take this carbon and to bind, bond it to these two oxygens is going to have an overall change of negative nine, uh, sorry, negative 394 kilojoules. And then to take the, these oxygens here 
and to you know attach these hydrogens in order to form those bonds and everything, it's going to have an overall enthalpy change of negative 572. So picture-wise, this is what's going on in order to get the overall change of negative 891. All right. So problem-solving strategies for enthalpy calculations. Again, when a reaction is reversed, just like before, the magnitude of delta H remains the same, but its sign is going to change, just like before with Hess's law. Balanced equations, same exact thing as before with Hess's law. So the delta H, if you multiply everything by 2 in your reaction, the delta H also has to be multiplied by 2. All right, and last but certainly not least here, we've got the change in enthalpy for a given reaction can be calculated from the enthalpy of formation of its reactants and products. Again, because these are state functions, we can take just the, the sum of all of your products and subtract the sum of all of your reactants, and we will get the overall enthalpy change for your reaction as a result of that. If you're wondering, this is the sum symbol. N is just the number of moles, because remember, it's proportional to the number of moles of each one of your uh, products multiplied by by the change in enthalpy formation. Okay, and again, it's just subtraction. That's really all it is. And like it says here again, something that I mentioned already but didn't explicitly put in the slides, elements in their standard states are not included because the dental, the, the dental, the delta H of formation for an element in its standard state is defined as zero. That's why oxygen was zero in that first example we just did. Okay, so let's calculate the delta H for the following reaction. I've got, you know, uh, sodium and water, and I'm making sodium hydroxide and hydrogen gas. So here is our table. Now, again, you could find all this information in the book, but I didn't want to just paste a picture of the book here. So here you go. Here are your values for our standard enthalpy of formation for these things. So all we're going to do is going to do our products minus our reactants. And so here I have my NaOH negative 470 okay also remember i would need to double that because i have two of them hydrogen's nice and easy it's zero so i don't have to worry about that but that's my product side now reactant side okay i'd have to subtract that so i'm going to subtract okay great sodium zero that's defined as zero because it's just in its standard state already all right, now what about water? Water is negative 286. Remember though, because there's a two in front, I need to double it. So I would do the following. So two times negative 470 minus two times negative 286. When I do that, I get negative 368 kilojoules. That would be the overall enthalpy change for this entire reaction using just the enthalpy change of formations uh, values in the appendix of your book. All right, so again, if you guys have any questions, please make sure you let me know, but please like this video and subscribe to the channel. I'll be actually going over um, chapter 16 next. I know that sounds weird, but chapter 16 is more thermochemistry, so they kind of flow together before we move on to another topic, all right? So thanks for checking it out. If you have any questions, let me know.